I do want to thank all of you for allowing me to be here. Uh, I feel like that uh, by me being here this Sunday, I've, I've come full circle. Many of you came to Dahlonega, whether it was for a town hall meeting or you came to some of our worship services. And yes, a part of me as a preacher was always like, well, they can just come to our church. It'll be okay. But I, but I knew that was wrong. It, it, in my heart, I knew, nope, that's not what you intend, God. And I could feel and I knew that God was going to do something. I didn't know what it was. But I knew God was going to do something. A miracle. And I can remember... As many of you came to Dahlonega for the town halls, I remember praying over you and with you, and my prayers continued for you. And I just had this feeling, this knowing, that God was going to do something through you. I knew it. I could see not just your faithfulness, but His faithfulness through you. And so today, to be here, And to finally be a witness to the miracle is joyous. To hear and see and know what the Holy Spirit is doing. I know sometimes you think, but we had to leave. Moses came and took the Israelites out of Egypt, did he not? And did he not lead them? Actually, God, not Moses, but God. Did he not lead them to the promised land? Yes, God is faithful. So this morning, as I come before you, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for not giving up. Thank you for standing in the truth and thank you that you have planted a church God's church and nothing or no one can destroy what God is doing amen Amen. so this morning I do want to say thank you to Janet and to everyone who has helped uh, me get ready for today You are an incredible group of folks. Just the moment Dan and I drove up this morning, your smiles, your greeting, the way that you just loved on us from the beginning. I do want to thank all of you for doing that this morning. But let's stand and let's get to the business that's most important, and that is the gospel. So this morning, I'm going to read a story that is so familiar But I ask that you hear it this morning with the the ears and the heart of the Holy Spirit. It comes from Matthew chapter 9, starting with verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. But I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we come before you ready to eat. So Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Speak, Holy Spirit, for your children are listening. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Matthew. How many of you watch The Chosen? Yep, me too. And if you know, a lot of folks ask me, they're like, do you actually, you know, go and see the movies that are about the Bible and all that? Not usually. I'm, I'm actually kind of a geek and a nerd when it comes to things like that. Dan can tell you that we um, have gone to see some of the movies that are supposed to be about the Bible, and I've gotten mad and walked out. Um, so I'm, I'm usually pretty hard on things like that, and, and I'll be honest with you, when I saw that uh, Jenkins was the one who was doing The Chosen, I immediately go back to the left behind, and I go, mm, don't know that I'm going to watch that. You know, um, but, and I can't even tell you why I watched it for the first time. I, I can't remember what happened. But I remember during the first season, I finally kind of broke down and said, okay, let me see what this is about. It was probably that some of my congregation members were watching The Chosen. And so I thought, I better see what this is about. Well, I was immediately hooked. It was surprising to me as I was watching this. And, I, and then I realized that Jenkins actually had, if you don't know this, he has a panel of folks who, who give him advice and pray over him before he created this series. He had a Jewish rabbi. He had a Catholic priest. I know this sounds like the beginning of a joke, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> He had uh, several Protestant preachers. He had several theologians. He had some seminary professors. He really did have a panel of folks. And what he was trying to do was to say, okay, this is what we have in the Word of God. And he, he honestly does not want to add to or take away, because we know that we don't want to do that. But he understood that we have to, have to kind of understand what's going on in society during that time. What was going on in the culture during that time. And so he uses that and this, always this. This is first, and he'll tell you this, that this is first. To try to kind of piece together some things that we don't, get totally in here. Think about it. This story that I just read to you about Matthew. Now, I personally believe Matthew wrote the book of Matthew. We can debate that some other time, but I do. I believe that Matthew wrote it. And so here he is. We come to the story that only he tells about his calling, about Jesus calling him into ministry, into being a disciple, discipleship. You would think, would you not, because Matthew is telling this story, that he would tell you what's going on in his head. Can you imagine you a sinner? And society sees you as a sinner. And Jesus looks at you. Do you notice this? Sometimes we miss things because we know the story so well we kind of gloss over it and don't really read it closely. Did you notice, though, that he didn't call Matthew's name? He looked at Matthew according to the gospel. And he said, follow me. Now, I wonder what was going through Matthew's head. If you've watched The Chosen, you can see that look. Now, The Chosen says that he did call his name. Matthew, son of Alphaeus. And he goes, me? But the Bible doesn't really tell us that. The Bible tells us that he looks at him. Jesus looks at Matthew. And he says, follow me. Has Jesus ever looked at you and said, follow me? 
And what does Matthew do? He follows him. That's all Matthew needs to tell us. Jesus said, follow me, and I did. You see, one of the things that we start to understand about Matthew is that the focus is not on Matthew. The focus is on Jesus. And Matthew helps us to understand that that is where our focus should always be. Not on what's going through Matthew's head or anything else, but simply on Jesus and on Jesus' words. Follow me. No other conversation. Follow me. He looks at him. Looks at his heart. This is a sinner, folks. This is a tax collector. And, And probably one thing that the chosen gets right is that he is an outcast by his own people. Jewish boys were not supposed to become tax collectors. But yet this is what Matthew does and so therefore he probably is an outcast. And yet Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, looks at Matthew and says, follow me. In those moments that Matthew leaves his old life, his sins are forgiven. His sins are forgiven. Can you see the scene before you? Kind of like Zacchaeus, another tax collector. And what Jesus said, I'm going to go have dinner with you tonight. Oh, and by the way, it's going to be at your house. (laughs) How many of you right now, if Jesus were to come to your house and have dinner, what would that be like? What does your house look like? In my case, I don't think there's any food in the refrigerator. We would have to have a a miracle of loaves and fishes at my house. It's amazing that we do not hear from Matthew that he's worried about that at all. I think Matthew knew immediately When Jesus had called him, I I think that he felt that transformation that was already taking place. And so when Jesus said, we're going to go to your house and we're going to have this meal at your house. Matthew didn't think another thing of it. And I am sure in that moment that Matthew thought if he transformed me, he can transform my friends. Because who comes to the dinner table? More tax collectors. And more sinners and the disciples. But can you imagine when when Jesus changes your life, you want to invite all your friends to the supper table. We're having a meal today. Who have you invited to the supper table? A lot of times what we miss in this story too is that when Jesus calls us, when Jesus says, follow me, then he's asking us to be the host. He's asking us to be the host so that Jesus may transform the lives of others. And that's what you Sawney Ridge have become. Jesus has transformed your lives and you now at this moment are the host. Who have you invited to the supper table? Who have you invited? Have you invited other Christians? 
Or have you invited other sinners? Have you invited folks that look and act and live as you do? Or have you invited the lost and the least? The ones who are struggling with depression, the ones who are struggling with addiction. Who have you invited to the supper table? God has planted his spirit in this church. It is a miracle. Do not miss the miracle. And he desires to continue that miracle through you. He doesn't need you, but he's going to use you. Oh, what a joyous thing to be used and to be called by Jesus. Who are you inviting to the supper table? Who are you inviting to the miracle? The Pharisees mock Jesus, do they not? They can't believe, they they miss the transformation of Matthew. They miss that totally. Just like they miss it when the blind see and the lame leap for joy. They missed it again. And all they are worried about is the fact that Jesus is eating with sinners and tax collectors. And what does Jesus say to them? It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but it is the sick. Who have you invited to the supper table? Who have you invited to receive a miracle today? For the last eight years, Dan and I have gone to a conference called New Room Conference. It was in areas of Nashville, around Nashville for many years, but the church we were meeting at was undergoing some construction, and so we couldn't meet in Nashville this year. So instead, Dan and I just got back from Houston, Texas. We met at the Woodlands Methodist Church in Texas, Houston. When New Room first started out, it was 200 folks. The next year it was like 800, and then it was 1,200. This year there were almost 3,000 folks in attendance at the New Room Conference. Yeah, miracle. It is a miracle. Last year, when we were still meeting in Nashville, we began to bring some young adults with us. Again, who are you bringing to the supper table? But we brought some young adults with us. There was one particular young adult who was struggling with alcoholism. Only in her 20s, late 20s. She had struggled since she was 12 years old with alcoholism. She will tell you the first time that she took a sip of alcohol, she was addicted. The first time she took a sip, she was addicted. We had been praying over her so many times. But she came with us last year. It was a miracle just the fact that she came. You see, I believe that she, like Matthew, heard Jesus saying, follow me, follow me. And so we brought her to New Room last year, to that conference. And there were incredible things that happened there. But it began in prayer. We prayed over that young woman constantly during that week. It got to be where she'd look at us and she goes, oh, they're coming after me again. They're coming after me again. It's like, yes, we are. And it started there. It started with prayer, praying over her. But finally, there was a moment in which we had an anointing service. 
and she was invited to the table where she received the body and blood of Jesus Christ, where she was anointed, baptized in the Holy Spirit. She had been baptized by water, but now she was truly baptized in the Holy Spirit. She, like Matthew, heard Jesus say, follow me. And she was invited to the table. Last Sunday, I will tell you, she came back to New Room with us this year with several other uh, young adults. But last Sunday, we had just gotten back from New Room. It's our 9.30 contemporary service, and she usually sits right outside of my office. My office is in the sanctuary, in the balcony section. She usually sits right back there, kind of off to herself. And all of a sudden, I hear someone saying to me, Robin, she's looking for you. She's looking for you. She's gone down to the altar. She's prayed. She's prayed. She's looking for you. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? She comes into my office. I find her. We go into my office. Tears streaming down her face. And she says, you know, I haven't had a drink since last new room. For a year, I have not had a drink. She said, but you don't understand. I haven't just not had a drink. I haven't had a desire for a drink. I hear people talk about how they have dreams about, I don't even dream about it. I don't even want it anymore. She said, my taste for alcohol is completely gone. And instead, I have a taste for the Holy Spirit. I have a taste for Jesus. You see, I've come to the table. I have eaten of life and life eternal. And he has performed a miracle in me and taken that taste totally away. And all I have is a taste for him. And Robin, I just want to invite everybody to the table. And this is when the tears started flowing with me. She said... I know that I'm called to seminary. I know that I am called by Jesus. You hear this, don't you? Just like Matthew. Jesus has called me now to be a minister of healing ministries. Healing ministries. Jesus desires mercy, not sacrifice, because he is the sacrifice. He's died for all of us, for you and for me and for that young woman. He is the sacrifice, and when you know that, and when he calls you, You get up immediately and you become the host of this meal where you know that Jesus is here. You are not the one who will do the miracle. It'll be Jesus. But who are you inviting today to come meet Jesus at this table where he looks that person in the eye and he gives his body and his blood to that person. And he says, follow me. There is nothing better, folks, than watching someone receive a miracle Someone who has lost her taste or his taste for the world. And instead, their only taste 
is for the one who says, I am the bread of life. So today, as we are preparing our hearts and minds for Holy Communion, I'm going to ask you again, who are you inviting to the table? I guarantee you, as I was saying this, everyone in this room thought of that one person, that one person who you can invite next Sunday. I'm going to ask you to pray that person's name, not just this whole week, but as you come to the table today to pray that person in your heart because the Holy Spirit already knows. It's also possible today that you are that person, that you are the one, the sinner, like we all are. Trust me, we all are. But perhaps you are that person and you are eager to get to this meal today. I promise you that Jesus will transform you. For you see, when you come to the table, you come as a sinner, but you leave as a disciple. That's why you've planted a church, folks. Because Jesus showed you the truth. That we welcome all in the doors. We welcome all to the table. But we know and are certain that God doesn't allow us to stay in our sin. But he transforms us. And he works a miracle that the world can never give.